Amen. There we go. Amen. Good to see everybody. You guys fired up? I love being in the park. Uh, my wife and I and uh, the kiddos, we uh, went up to Canada this, last week to uh, just get away, see the nature, look at mountains, follow animals. It was a lot of fun. So it's, it's kind of funny, you know, coming back, now every time I see a, a hill or a tree, I'm looking for like a bear or a mountain goat. I got to remember I'm back in Seattle. But uh, it is good to be in nature, amen, and it is good to know that we're not going to get attacked by a grizzly out here. And we can just come together, we can worship God and have a good time, amen? Um, you know, it really is incredible what God is doing around the world right now. And I know that there are a lot of political things and a lot of things in the economy that are questionable and everything right now, uh, things in uh, the politics and, uh, you know, different things that the, the politicians are doing or whatever, but uh, we're not here to talk about any of that. Right. We're here to talk about the only subject that really matters, on, climate change. <laughs> That's the title of our message this morning, although we're not talking about the weather. We're talking about the climate of the world that we're living in and the climate of the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's turn our Bible to Matthew chapter 24. Okay. It's going to be a very exciting week. God is moving in a lot of, a lot of different ways all over the world. Uh, the churches are doing well. The churches are happy and growing. And it's very exciting to watch what God is doing all over the world. Amen? You know, here in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gives us a little bit of a prediction of something that would happen to those Jews in that day. But also, it would be a double prophecy for our day and the generation that we are now currently living in. As you read this passage, I want you to understand that what Jesus is going to predict is a very scary thing. In Matthew chapter 24, we'll start our reading here in verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me at that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold but he who stands firm to the end or she who stands firm to the end will be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now for the Jews back then, the end that he's referring to is about 70 AD. Because as the ICCM students understand, in 66 AD, Emperor Nero uh, had to fight against this Judean revolt where all of the Jews were revolting against the Roman rule. And four years later, he sends out his vast army into Jerusalem, led by Emperor Titus, well, soon to be Emperor Titus, to go and kill the Jews and to destroy different pockets of Jerusalem, including the temple itself. And so the prophecy that Jesus gives here is, listen, you guys will evangelize the world and then the end will come the end of the temple, and the end of the Jewish people. And at that time, around 70 AD, Emperor Titus and Emperor Nero would kill over 1.1 million Jews. It was a devastation to not just the Jewish population, but a time of confusion for all of those who practiced the Judaism religion. A time of confusion. Because for the previous 2,000 years, these were God's people. And now they're being destroyed by these enemies in the world. Jesus tells them, there are two things that you can be absolutely sure of. The increase of wickedness and the growing cold of people's hearts. Wow. You know, these are very scary things. He also talks about the false prophets, the false religion. He talks about the persecution and the fact that people will get so bitter 
that they will betray and hate each other. I mean, you can go from best friends to being betrayed overnight because of the bitterness that has entered these people's hearts. And yet Jesus says, why is all this happening? The increase of wickedness and the love of most growing cold. And isn't this what we see in our world today? This climate change is on a decline. Things are looking worse and worse for our world. Every day, in the increase of wickedness is prevalent, and it's obvious, and we see it. Even the Bible talks about people are going to start inventing ways to sin. And now we've seen that. I mean, we've seen all sorts of crazy sorts of sins just enter the world and become more obvious than ever. And yet we also see the decline of love in our society and how not personal people want to be anymore. I mean, it's gone from face-to-face conversations to phone conversations to now text conversations to now emojis, which don't really have any sort of conversation, but you kind of get the idea of what someone's talking about. You know, we've, our relationships are growing more and more shallow. Dating used to be something that you do with somebody that you meet. Now it's something you do with someone you've watched online. I mean, I've, I've talked to people that are, that are dating other people in other countries they've never even met before. I mean, just the idea of love has so much been twisted by the increase of wickedness in the world. This means that two things are now more challenging than ever to every single one of us. The number one thing is staying holy because of the increase of wickedness. But what that also means is that when you are holy, you shine ever brighter. But then number two, deep relationships become very challenging because the love of most is growing cold. But again, what that also means is the true love of the kingdom shines ever brighter and becomes all the more obvious to those in the world. Look over in Revelation chapter 22. You know, very excitingly, we're going to, uh, many of us are going to uh, Manila, Philippines this week. And uh, our church, our, our family of churches is hosting an event there called the Global Leadership Conference. And while we're out there, the, the title, the theme of the conference is Victorious, which is the central theme of the book of Revelation. You see, over the last five or six years, we've studied out sections of the Bible, and all of these have now led up to the climax, which is the book of Revelation, the victory of God's people. And here at the very end of the book of Revelation, we read in verse 14, Revelation 22, verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. You know, right here, Jesus says, listen, if you wash your robes, other translations say, if you do the commands of God, it says you will be able to enter through the gates. Don't you look forward to that day? I mean, death is not something fun to look forward to. Judgment isn't that fun to look forward to. But when all that is said and done and you get to enter through the gates of heaven, that's something to look forward to. That's going to be a time where we all get to commune with Jesus permanently. We get to be with each other and there is no more sin in heaven. No more tears, no more sadness. We get to be together and worship God for all of eternity. I'm pretty fired up about that. And then... Outside of those gates are the dogs. Now, I've looked at a lot of translations. I looked at about 30 translations trying to find a better translation for this word dog. And every single translation says they're dogs. There's no way around this. You go, well, that's offensive. Absolutely, it's offensive. And your sin is offensive to God. And God says, you want to live like this? You're going to be a dog outside of these gates. Well, who is going to be outside the gates? I don't want to be outside the gates. He goes, those who practice magic arts, witchcraft, people involved in in worshiping or doing things outside of the practice of Christianity. Those people are dogs. He says the sexually immoral. 
people who live sexual lifestyles outside of marriage, those are dogs and they belong outside the gates. The murderers, of course they're dogs. Of course they're dogs. But we know that murderers can be forgiven and they can become Christians too. But if they don't, they're dogs and they're outside the gates. The idolaters. Well, that's, that's a piece of, I mean, I'm never a dog. I mean, I, I don't have any sort of statues under my bed or any sort of shrines in my house. I, I'm not an idolater. An idolater is anybody that, that practices something that's more valuable to them than their relationship with God. Yes. You can idolize TV. You can idolize sleep. You can idolize food. You can idolize money. These things are idols. And if you allow them to be more important than your walk with God, you're an idolater and a dog, and you're outside of the gates. This is not me. This is the Word of God. But then it says, everyone who practices and loves falsehood, stealing, lying, wronging people, wronging God, these are dogs outside the gates. Now, who wants to be a dog? No. 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 No one wants to be a dog. Who wants to be inside the gates? Now, if dogs are outside the gate, who's inside the gates? The repentant dogs. These are the ones that actually change their life. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, you look around, we're all sinners. There are two kinds of people in this world, unrepentant sinners and repentant sinners, but we're all sinners. We're all, we can all acknowledge and be humble in the eyes of God. Listen, I'm a dog. I've got a lot of things to grow in. Yeah. But are you inside the gates? Are you a humble, repentant dog? Come on, Joe. I, kind of, I kind of imagine that one as like a little puppy. Aww. And the one outside the gate is like the ferocious, like wolf-looking dog. Right? I mean, I want to be a little puppy in the kingdom of God. Yeah. I know I blow it. I know I mess up. But I'm humble enough to admit it. Because I want to be in the gates. You guys with me here? Yeah. You know, I think one of the awesome, most prevalent signs of the kingdom of God is just the joy that comes into the kingdom in people's hearts. I mean, I look around and, and right here it says, blessed are those who wash their robes, who do the commandments. When people are doing the will of God, isn't there a happiness and a joy that enters their life? Yeah. I mean, a true happiness, a true sincerity, a true joy. When you're in sin, you know you're in sin, and you feel bad about your sin, and it robs you of your joy. Yes. But in the kingdom, you're so happy because you know you're in sin, but you repented of that sin, and you're grateful for the grace of God. And so inside the kingdom, there is a great joy. I mean, I look at the faces of some of the disciples in the church, and I go, wow, that is a happy, repentant, fired up, joyful disciple. I mean, okay. Nita walked in this morning. <laughs> And I go, wow, sis, you look so happy. You always look happy. She said, bro, stop being sarcastic. I said, I'm serious. <laughs> Generally speaking, you look happy. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think of Gilbert. And, you know, <laughs> Gilbert could have just had the worst day of his life, and you never guess it. He's joyful. He's happy. He's blessed because he's in going into the gates. Amen? I think of Naila. Serving, giving, loving, happy, blessed. I mean, that, that's, that's the mark of a true disciple. And then some of us don't look so happy. I think of... Whose name just came to your head? I don't know, but if that person's not happy, you should go have a talk with them. And go, brother, sister, are you doing all right? I thought of your name when Joel made me fill in the blank. I thought of you. Are you okay? Do you understand the grace of God? Because if you don't, you're not going to be blessed. You're not going to be happy. And that's a mark of those in the kingdom. Why are we happy? Because we're grateful. We know we're dogs. We know we don't deserve to be in the gates. So we're grateful and we're happy that we get to be blessed by God. You know, it's interesting here. He says, you wash your robes. You do the commands that you may have the right. You haven't deserved this. Just because you washed your robe does not mean that all of a sudden you deserve to be here. No, you never deserve to be here. None of us ever deserve to be here. It's God that brought you in. 
It's God that's allowing you to do these different things. It's the grace of God that you just took a breath. That was the grace of God. Because if it were Old Testament times, you would have been dead a long time ago. But the grace of God is all the more prevalent in our lives because the Spirit of God is so powerful and He forgives us by His grace. Look over here in verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. You know, it's incredible. The Bible was not written by man. And yet the Bible was written by man. (laughs) Jesus says, I sent an angel to you. And listen, it's only because of me that you have this testimony to share. You know, when I think of the Bible, I'm just so blown away by the power of God. I mean, the fact that a book can be written over 1,500 years by over 40 different authors, speaking three different languages from three different, different, you know, continents. You got people living in Africa, Europe, Asia, speaking Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. I mean, these people don't know each other. They're not usually related to each other. You got them all over the place, and yet they write these words down on a piece of paper, and they come together so perfectly. No loopholes, no contradictions. Atheists have been trying to tear the Bible apart for centuries and have yet to do so. The Bible makes perfect sense. If everything's taken in context, it is absolutely the perfection of God. You know, it's incredible that Jesus would send an angel to John. I mean, at this point, it's between 95 and 105 AD. John has been exiled onto the island of Patmos because of his great faith. They tried to kill him. He wouldn't die. They threw him in a cauldron of boiling oil three times, and he lived each time. And they said, we we cannot kill this guy. Let's just exile him onto an island. And he's there and he gets to talk to Jesus. He gets to talk to an angel all by himself. And yet the Lord sent him a companion and gave him this incredible revelation. And therefore we have the book of Revelation. Why is that important? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. We're going to come back to that. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy in this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life, and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies these things says, Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with with God's people. Amen. Amen. You know, this is incredible right here. The Bible tells us that we have a free gift of water of life. A free gift. You've done nothing to earn it, nothing to deserve it, and yet Jesus gives it to you because he loves you, and by his grace and by his mercy, you now have this gift of life. You know, it's incredible. He says it's the water of life. I don't know if there's anything more refreshing to imagine than a nice glass of water on a hot summer day. I mean, we were up there in Canada, and believe it or not, it hit 90 degrees while we were up there. And we went to this place called, uh, this place called Lake Louise. And it's one of the highlights of Banff National Park. And we go there and you, you drive, you got to walk up this, this hill. I mean, there's, there's thousands of people. It's that big of a deal. And you walk up there and you kind of look over this little hill. You see some blue. You're not too sure exactly how big the lake is. And then you're standing on the lake and the lake is as blue as you can imagine. It's blue, bluer than the sky. I'm not, I'm not exactly, I have pictures of it. It's bluer than the sky. And it's surrounded by, by mountains. And then there's this one mountain in the middle. It's just covered in a glacier. And the water is just kind of trickling down into, into the lake. And then the lake empties out into a stream. They call it uh, Paradise Creek. And it's just so gorgeous. It's so beautiful. 
and it's 90 degrees. You know, we're, we're sweating, we're, we're hot, we're exhausted. Brinton's like going delirious. <laughs> and yet we get to the water and just this sense of refreshment comes over us. We walked over by the side where there were less people, took our shoes off, me and Brinton, and we jumped down into the water and it was ice cold. I mean, I think water freezes at like 32 degrees. This water is probably like 33 degrees. It was so cold. And we go down into the water and it was just incredibly refreshing. You know, that's to me, that, that's the perfect imagery for the water of life. Life gets hot. Life gets heated. Life is exhausting. We worry. We go through trials. It's challenging. But then you get to this paradise creek. You get to this beautiful lake of God. And it's just refreshing to your soul. I've got to ask you, are you standing on the edge of Paradise Creek, Lake Louise? Are you allowing yourself to get refreshed and rejuvenated by the Word of God every day? Are your roots deeply in the soil, soaking up all the nutrients from the water? How close to God are you this morning? You go, well, you know, it's been a tough few weeks. There are no excuses. There are no struggles, no temptations that God did not allow in your life and entrust that you can overcome these challenges. There are no excuses. You go, well, I've just been working a lot, going through a lot financially. You know, school's been very challenging. I've yet to find a significant other. God goes, there are no excuses. There are no excuses. This is Paradise Creek. There is nowhere you should rather be, nothing you should rather do than to stand on the refreshing waters of Paradise Creek. You know, this is a free gift dedicated to those who have dedicated themselves to a life of holiness. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You know... Freedom is found by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Because God is the Spirit and God gives us freedom. Now there's a misconception out there that holiness is heavy. And that to be a disciple is too hard, too challenging, and certainly not worth it. Let me tell you, this is truly a misconception. There is nothing that could deceive you more than being a disciple is hard. There's nothing hard about being saved. There's nothing hard about receiving the gift of God. There's nothing hard about being refreshed on a daily basis. What makes it hard is your sinful nature. But salvation itself is not hard to accept. It's an incredible thing to be given by God. In fact, there's nothing that you would rather have than salvation from the Lord. And with this comes a freedom. I've got to encourage you to build a conviction on Matthew Chapter 11, that said, where Jesus says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. 1 John chapter 5, His commands are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. Anybody can do this. You don't need a degree in rocket science to figure this out. You know, as the world is increasing in wickedness, the kingdom of God has ever increasing glory. Isn't that awesome? The Spirit of God is working. Why is that? Because the darker the world gets, the brighter the church gets. And what is the church? But God's people. And as the people draw closer to God, their light shines all the brighter. I'll tell you what. The 2017 Global Leadership Conference is going to be the best one yet. It's going to be incredible. To be together with God's people there in Manila, Philippines. You go, well, why are we going to Manila? It's so expensive. It's so much money 
This isn't the last international GLC we're going to have, guys. In fact, the plan is that every two to four years, we're going to have an international GLC. So start putting it in your budget. But you know, there's a lot of people in our churches around the world that will never be able to afford to leave the country to meet disciples from other countries. They'll never be able to afford it. And yet we in America, we can't afford it. Relative to these people, we're a lot more wealthy than they are. And you know, sometimes Moses goes to the mountain, sometimes the mountain goes to Moses. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, some of these disciples, their only chance at being inspired and meeting other disciples from other countries are if we all go to them. It's a lot easier for us to get visas. It's a lot easier. Why? Because we're rich. And these other countries, they want your tourism and they want your money. They go, absolutely, come on and visit and spend all the money you got. So we're going to be doing these. Why? Because we want to show these valuable disciples that, listen, you have family all over the world that cares about you, that loves you in a deep way. You know, it's incredible the transformation that's going to happen. Those of us who go, we're going to come back more inspired than ever, more motivated, and in a sense transformed by the Spirit of God and the fellowship that we're going to experience there. You know, there's probably nothing more transforming than flat out repentance. And I've just been so incredibly blown away by little Ricky, yeah. aka Eric Jones. I mean, I mean, Eric, Eric's repentance has refreshed the whole church. That's not an exaggeration. It's refreshed the whole church. I mean, it used to be like, hey, Eric, you think you could sing a song this Sunday? And now it's like, hey, what song do you want me to sing? The, the repentance has been refreshing to everybody. Everybody. Some of you, if you would only repent, it would refresh the whole church. You go, why? I don't have that many great relationships. That's the problem. And the moment you repent, it's going to refresh the whole church. I'm just so inspired by how the Lord is using Eric already. Already. Over a year ago, Eric pays $67 for an Uber to come from Federal Way all the way to a park service we had over at Magnuson Park. And he came on out and we had a good time. It was awesome getting to know him. He was about to take an Uber all the way back to Federal Way. I said, bro, just let me drive you back. I drove him back to Federal Way. We had a great talk and a week later, Eric got restored at the inaugural service. At the inaugural service, he had out a bunch of family members, including his cousin Terry here. And Terry, Terry came on out, maybe a little skeptical, but we had basketball in common, so pretty easy to connect there. I would drive down to South Center Mall, I don't know how many times over the next couple months to study the Bible with Terry, but Terry got to a point where he was allowing the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth to weigh him down. And he started skipping church for work, he stopped getting back to us. He got over busy with things that really, in the grand scheme of things, don't matter all that much. And he stopped studying the Bible, and he just got focused on his own personal life down there in Federal Way. Over the last year, God's done a number on Terry to humble him on out, including tearing his Achilles ankle playing some basketball. Terry's playing some basketball, which is the love of one of the loves of his life. And someone steps on his foot, and he goes to jump, and his Achilles just snaps. And he goes, you know what? This is a challenging time. About a month later, he humbled on out and he goes, I need some help spiritually. I mean, I'm sitting around all day. I got nothing to do but play video games, talk to people on the phone. I need some spiritual help. He starts praying. He starts reading. He goes, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to call up the one person I can think of that's going to help me spiritually and challenge me. And that's Joel. He gives me a call, call, you know, comes on out to church. We start studying the Bible. And here we are a few weeks later. The Lord has used Eric and David and the rest of the Bible talk to really win him over and today he's going to be baptized as a brother in Christ at Magnuson Park, the same place where Eric came out for the first time. You go, well, Joel, I've never been personally fruitful. I've never brought someone out to the kingdom. They loved it and they got baptized as a true disciple. I've never been able to do that. Repentance brings refreshment. There's something in your heart that's disabling you from being used by God to be fruitful. Let me tell you, God wants all of us to be fruitful as much as He can. 
God's got great vision for each and every one of us. But it starts in your heart. And the moment you repent, the moment you get refreshed, refresh the church, refresh others, I'm telling you, the Lord's going to use you to do great things. It's by the grace of God that we're saved. But isn't it incredible the responsibility that God puts on each and every one of us to be the ones that make the disciples that get baptized. And God wants to use you in a powerful way. The holiness that we're talking about is a challenging holiness because of our sinful nature. But the holiness itself is refreshing and enlightening. And you will be a light to the world if only you would allow yourself to be the spiritual example that the world needs. You know, the other part of Matthew 24 is, yes, there is an increase of wickedness. And yes, sin is all the more available. But because of that, the love of most will grow cold. In essence, relationships are the second most challenging thing that we're ever going to face as disciples. A loving, Christ-like relationship. In the same way that Jesus was willing to die for you, so friends ought to lay down their lives for each other. 1 John 3.16 So the heart for all of us to build deep relationships is challenging. You know, the number one place where perhaps you would think love should be the most obvious is in marriage. And yet, the divorce rate continues to increase. The love of most will grow cold. Look over in Ephesians chapter 4. You go, well, it's hard to love people that I have nothing in common with. Listen, if you got Jesus in common, you got everything you need to have in common with anybody. You go, well, it's, it's hard to, to be close to people that, that aren't from my same kind of background. It's hard to be close to people where we have totally different cultures. We're, we're different kind of people. Our, 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 our personalities just kind of clash and, and we don't get along all that well naturally. That may be all true. But it's still not an excuse to become best friends with those around us. I want to talk about three different kinds of relationships here from one verse in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. You know, if you, if you really believe that God is over all, through all, and in all, you're going to do all that you can do to be unified with your brothers and your sisters. The three types of relationships I want to cover here kind of quickly is number one, the David and the Jonathan relationship. These are just the two best friends. You might call them brothers and sisters. The people that, in a sense, your peers, you can let your hair down with them. You can have great conversations with them and be open about all your sin and get the discipling that you need from them. The second kind of relationship is a Paul and Timothy relationship. In a way, a father or mother in the faith. You're the son in the faith. They're the father in the faith. This is somebody that can mentor you and advise you and help you on a regular basis. We all need a father or a mother in the faith. And the cool thing about this is it doesn't matter what their physical age is. It matters where they're at spiritually. And if you look up to them, that can be your father in faith. That can be your mother in the faith. But if you're a Christian, you need to claim somebody as your mother or your father in the faith. You need to adopt yourself into a family, so to speak, with a mother or a father in the faith. You go, I don't have to. You need it. We all need it. The third kind is kind of like in the Old Testament, you see the prophets and the kings. The king was kind of in charge of what was going on, but the prophet was always available as an advisor, kind of like an uncle or an auntie in the faith. This is that person that maybe you don't talk to on a regular basis, but you go through a challenging time and you can call them on up and they're going to be available for you. They could be in another church, they could be in another city, another country, but you always know that they're going to be there for you when you need them. We need all three of these kinds of relationships. Not just one, not just two, all three. Brothers and sisters, moms and dads, 
aunties and uncles. Amen? Amen. What does that mean? It means that the relationships with the increasing love is going to look like family. It's going to look like family. We've got to fight for these relationships because society doesn't want you to have these relationships. In fact, in America, we're taught that independence is the way to go. Isolate yourself. Be a loner. Do things on your own. And that is completely the opposite of what the Bible teaches, where you need God and you absolutely need each other. In the Old Testament, it was a physical kingdom. In the New Testament, and in our day, it's a spiritual kingdom where we're in each other's lives on a regular basis. You guys with me here? You know, whether we're talking about holiness or whether we're talking about deep, valuable, spiritual relationships, these are our two greatest challenges that we face together. We need to come together and get a conviction about this. Because I'm telling you that even this week, you're going to be attacked in both of these ways. Satan's going to go after your relationships, and he's going to go after your relationship with God. The number one key is, in, is found in Matthew chapter 22, and we'll close here. Like I said, many of us are going to the Global Leadership Conference, amen? And, uh, you know... In that is the fact that the leaders are going to the Global Leadership Conference. And we all know the saying, "Why, while the cat is away, the mice will play. And we've just got to be aware of the fact that Satan's going to go after all of us in these two different ways. And in Matthew 22, there's a, there's a man here who questions Jesus. And Jesus tells him, listen, you do this, you will wash your robes, in a sense. Verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You know, Jesus tells us that the number two struggles that we're going to go through are in our holiness and in our love for each other. And yet the greatest commandments that God gives us is loving God being holy, and loving your neighbor, loving each other, which is our love and our relationships. This week, let us all be focused on this. Let us take these convictions to heart so that together we can go after the attacks that Satan's going to use against us. I want to close with this incredible quote that our brother Tim Morse gave to me the other day. You find this quote immortalized on the I-5 bridge as you cross from Washington into Oregon. And it says this, Therefore, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for the present delight, nor for present use alone. Let it be for such work as our descendants will thank us for. And let us think as we lay stone on stone that a time is to come when those stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them and that men will say as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them. See, this our fathers did for us. Brothers and sisters, we're laying a foundation for the future. Let us build in a valiant way. I love you very much.